Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I'm Elliot Forrest from WQXR, and we're here live in the Jerome L. Green Performance Space. Today, we're here to celebrate the recipients of the Avery Fisher Career Grants. And to kick off the program, it is my pleasure to introduce the chair of the Avery Fisher Artist Program, also executive advisor to the president and board of directors of the New York Philharmonic and founder of Borda Arts Consulting. Please welcome Deborah Borda. Elliot, I like that gesture. It's always, it's always a little scary in New York when somebody says, I'm going to give you a gesture. <laughs> but well done, Elliot. Uh, and as Elliot said, with the expectation of spring, which is not quite here yet, welcome on behalf of all the people who we've wel welcomed you on behalf of, uh, including the Fisher family. But I also want to recognize a number of people who are here today who are the folks who actually review the videos and the streaming and everything to make the decisions. That's our executive um, committee. And they're here. Mary Lou Falcone, please stand as I call. There you are. Uh, Gary Ginsling, our newest member, my colleague from the New York Philharmonic. Ara Guzalimian, Ara's up here. All right. I love that I get to welcome you twice, Anthony. Anthony McGill. <laughs> Chad Smith from the Boston Symphony. And Shanta Thack, where are you, Shanta? There, we, there she is, head of music, uh, artistic director at Lincoln Center. And also, I should say that the Avery Fisher program is a constituent of Lincoln Center, so that's very nice. We also thank, uh, as uh, far as uh, Elliot said, our recommendation board. Now, so many of you knew Avery. I knew Avery. He was, he was a brilliant man, but he was passionate about classical music, and he was also very generous. I mean, his name was on a very important place in um, New York City, but we remember him uh, very well for that. Um, but he has really left his mark in so many ways about what was his passion. And what was his passion? Music, and especially classical music. And as Eliot said, 50 years later, we are still forging ahead in what is clearly one of the premium programs or premier programs in the United States. So tonight, we're going to get as quickly as possible to celebrate our winners. Um, so these today are the Avery Fisher Career Grants. Now what's interesting about this, I think, is not only does the panel, the executive committee, recognize exceptional talent, and of course that is always first, but we also try to take into account that sort of imperceptible moment of timing. What is the right time? When does one of these awards really make a difference to an organization? And if you look at the past list of recipients, it's remarkably robust. There will barely be a name on there that you don't know. And that's the career grants, and you all know what the big prize is. It's a rigorous process. I have to say I have a very, very difficult job. I have to rein in the arguments of our executive committee. And I mean, sometimes pizzas are thrown across the room. <laughs> but we all agree, and we never vote. We come to everything by consensus. The, we can select up to five groups or single people a year. Each group or person gets 25,000, um, and so we're about to hear them. Um, thanks to Ed and WQXR. And now, um, unfortunately, uh, Nancy Fisher can't be here today, but fortunately, our executive director of the Avery Fisher program, Veronique Fercushny, is here. And without further ado, I will ask her to come up here and welcome the recipients and probably welcome all of you again. Come on up. <laughs> Thank you, Deborah. <laughs> Thank you, Deborah, and welcome to everyone. Um, yes, regrettably, Nancy Fisher tested positive for COVID this morning, but she is joining us on the live stream, and she has asked me to share her remarks. So, on behalf of Nancy Fisher, while my father was alive, he would personally call each recipient of a career grant, and also the prize, to share the exciting news. He took great pleasure in hearing the surprise on the other end of the line, and was also deeply rewarded by the appreciation he heard in the recipient's voices. He and my mother, Janet, would then keep a close watch on the artist's careers. 
Fifty years ago, Avery established the Avery Fisher Artist Program as a way to recognize and support young musicians committed to excellence and with great promise for the future. The Avery Fisher Career Grants exemplify this commitment. He also believed in honoring established musicians who have become beacons in the world of classical music. And these individuals are honored with the Avery Fisher Prize. And as we've already said, we have one of them with us here today, Anthony McGill, who before he received the prize in 2020 was also a career grant recipient. Over the past 50 years, there were individuals along the way whose expertise and guidance were invaluable to shaping the program into what it is today. One of those individuals was Mark Schubart, who with Avery devised the program, and another was Mary Lou Falcone, who worked closely with Avery until his death in 1994 and oversaw the program for 35 years. And her commitment continues as a member of the executive committee. And then Nancy continues. As one of three family advisors to the program, I have witnessed firsthand the dedication of the recommendation board and the level of care and knowledge exemplified by the members of the executive committee who volunteer their time and make the final choices. On behalf of the Fisher family, I thank them all as we celebrate the Avery Fisher Artist Program's 50th anniversary year. And now it's my great pleasure to announce the 2024 Avery Fisher Career Grant recipients. The Ballarday Quartet, Angioma Chinior Agrivius, violinist, Julian Ree, violinist, Clayton Stevenson, pianist, and Sandbox Percussion. Congratulations. Welcome to the presentation of the 2024 Avery Fisher Career Grant Awards. I'm Elliot Forrest from WQXR, and we're coming to you live from the Jerome L. Green space. When Avery Fisher established the Avery Fisher Artist Program in 1974, he said, quote, musicians of outstanding ability are such an important part of our culture, but they're like flowers. They must bloom at a particular time. They have to be helped at the right moments. The program celebrates its 50th anniversary this year and was the first major award in the United States to not be competition-based. Instead, Avery Fisher himself created the conditions for these grants. There's no competition, there's no application, recommendations are confidential. Young artists are observed over time. Artistic merit is evaluated based on a body of work, not judged on a command performance at one particular moment. One qualification is that they must be U.S. citizens or permanent U.S. residents, and the news of being selected comes as a complete surprise to each recipient. Tonight, we're going to introduce you to three artists and two ensembles, and here they are in alphabetical order. The Ballarday Quartet, violinist Ngioma Chenure Grievous, violinist Julian Ree, sandbox percussion, and pianist Clayton Stevenson. First up, the Ballard Day Quartet. Uh, the story of our first recipients uh, begins in the mountains of Taos, New Mexico, where three friends bonded over chamber music, food, and peppermint schnapps. <laughs> I think there's a bigger story there we're not telling. <laughs> not long after, the group met another collaborator at Rice University in Houston, Texas, and the Ballard Day Quartet was formed. Since then, their careers have been nothing short of meteoric winning countless competitions and becoming the only quartet admitted to the New England Conservatory's professional string quartet program. They are currently in residence with the Chamber Orchestra of the Triangle in North Carolina and at Indiana University's Jacobs School of Music. Please welcome the Ballarday Quartet. We're going to hear them perform the fourth movement from the String Quartet in F, Opus 59, the Razumovsky of Beethoven. Enjoy. Thank you. 
The Ballard Day Quartet playing the music of Beethoven. Live in the green space here on WQXR. Looks like it's a workout for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Why the Beethoven? Why did you decide to play that today? Well, we really wanted to feature one of the all-time great string quartets. This is one of those pieces that really changed music forever in the first decade of the 1800s, along with Beethoven's symphonies. And th this movement is really special in that he picked a folk tune that was part of uh, the commission requirement by Count Razumovsky, but he turned something that was sad and like a dirge and turned it into this playful, joyous, wonderful finale movement that kind of issues the springtime just like it is today. Beautiful. And <laughs> the name of the quartet, how did you come by that? Well, as you mentioned earlier, three of us met at the Taos School of Music, and we met Ben again later. and. Actually, we really wanted to honor somehow the spirit of chamber music that exists in Taos, which is just really loving each other, and it's all about friendship and communing over the amazing French food that they had at the Hotel St. Bernard, <laughs> where the festival used to be held. And actually, it's a funny story. I found the business card of Antoine Ballarday in my shoe when we were first having to name ourselves, and I said, what do you guys think about Ballarday? And that was that. Was that. <laughs> And that's the chef there? He's the, he, he is the chef there. Yeah, he's a <laughs> great guy, lover of life, lover of music. And he sort of would bring us together at night and we would party and he would make these extravagant French meals for us, or not even French all the time. One time we had filet mignon nachos and that was, <laughs> that was nuts. So you get a little percentage of this every year? <laughs> What's his deal in this? Uh, he, he was very excited about the name when we <laughs> told him. And it's really a good name for us because we really commune over food and we love sharing meals together when we're on the road. I think we eat every meal together actually and that's really when we get to catch up with each other and be together as friends and as a quartet. That's very cool. And uh, there's a democratic nature to this quartet. How does that work? I think to kind of go off of Russell's answer, the democratic ideal kind of, we define it more as our rare closeness and friendship that we have and the chemistry our quartet has a group. I think deep down, even though we love rehearsing and stuff, it's more about the four of us and having a good time together, um, just learning about life and going through life together. S starting from the early 20s, now one of us, we're, one of us is 30 now, and it feels, <laughs> it feels oh like- Oh my. <laughs> I know, wow. crazy. Um, yeah, so we like to define democratic ideals more as like how to figure out life together in this day and age, I guess. And uh, future projects, what are you working on? So we had a lot of things we actually had been wanting to do, and by winning this award, we're actually able to do some stuff we've been dying to do. So we have a few composers in mind and some commissions, and we also want to get some new headshots, but <laughs> we're really excited. We can't tell you like too much about it, but we're, we're really excited about the people we're going to work with. Very exciting. Once again, congratulations. Let's hear it for the Ballard Day Quartet. <laughs> You're in for a treat. Our next recipient began studying violin at the age of four, a native of Massachusetts. She found her way to New York as a student of Juilliard, where she was a founding member of the Abeo Quartet. Known for her versatility as a chamber musician and a soloist, she was hailed as superb by the Chicago Classical Review. Her technical mastery and emotional insight, she's won prizes from the pre ravel and the Sphinx competition, and she and I were together recently as she got an award from the National Arts Club performing the first movement of Maurice Ravel's Violin Sonata No. 2 with pianist Gilles Van Sattel. Please help me welcome Angioma Chinere Grievous. As some of you may know, uh, Gilles was a recipient in 2008 of this award. Thank you so much for being here and performing today. Here, once again, Angioma Grievous and the music of Maurice Ravel. So, what's this award meant for you, Gilles? very grateful for it. It was a wonderful uh, experience and I'm very moved to be here. It was in the Rose Studio when I had to play and I played a piece by Ravel too. So 
And I'm playing with uh, Ty Murray tomorrow in Canada, who's another recipient, a wonderful recipient of this award. So it's been great and an honor to be back. There you go. Congratulations for that. You all set? All right, good. I'm going to get out of the way. Here, we'll start again. Ladies and gentlemen, Angioma Grievous.
and Jill McGrevious. Jill Von Saddle. Music of Maurice Ravel, the violin sonata number two. It's really beautiful. So this is a who's who of classical music around the country, around in this room right this very minute, and I think they all have one question in mind. Who are you wearing? <laughs> my mom is my stylist. <laughs> we love her. I got to meet your mom last time. Tell us about the piece. Why did you decide to play this? So, I mean, I, I love this piece so much. Ravel wrote this piece between 1923 and 1927. He became fascinated with the African-American art forms of blues and jazz. And the second movement uh, is really where you feel that strong sense of blues. And I feel like this first movement, Ravel is really giving this feeling of improvisation. And so I like to think of this movement as a prelude to that second movement uh, in terms of its relation to jazz and blues. I also just love the interplay between the violin and the piano. It's kind of like there's two different conversations happening at the, at the same time, but they're interwoven. And uh, you do the solo work as well as chamber music. How do they complement e each other for you? Yes, so I am a founding member of the Abeo Quartet. We formed at the Juilliard School in 2018, and right, right away we just knew that the intimacy of string quartet is something that we wanted to put our stamp on. So I absolutely love chamber music, and I love playing solo music as well. And for me, these two disciplines really complement each other. And I know that for, for me personally, I couldn't imagine a life without one or the other. So it, it just really feeds my soul to be able to do both. And you have a project called Opportunity Music Project. What is that? Yes, so um, it's a wonderful organization that I became a part of a couple of years ago. Uh, a friend of mine from Juilliard, we started teaching a composition class. Um, and I'm not the composer of the duo, but I love being the collaborative partner. And so I love workshop workshopping the younger students' pieces, kind of teaching them what different techniques they can write for for strings. And it's just a, a, a wonderful joy for me. And in particular, OMP serves students who struggle financially. And I know that if it wasn't for my string training program growing up, Project Step in Boston, music being in this field is extremely expensive, and I wouldn't be here today without any of that. So. And what's on the horizon for you next? So on the horizon for me, um, lots of exciting things. Uh, first is a, a performance of the Dvorak Violin Concerto with the incredible conductor, Kalina Bovell, and we'll be playing with the Salisbury Symphony in North Carolina. The Abeo Quartet has a continued residency uh, at the Caramore Center for Music and the Arts in late April, and we're also going to La Jolla Summerfest. And in the fall, I have some recitals myself uh, in California, Arizona, and also will be playing at Carnegie Hall with the Sphinx Virtuosi. And I just wanted to say be, uh, before I forget that I'm incredibly grateful to Deborah Borda, the committee, Avery Fisher, the Avery Fisher family, and this entire organization for this incredible gift and meaningful just support and encouragement to continue doing what I'm doing and doing what I love. So. And Gio Magrebius, I'm so proud of you. Thank you so much. Deborah, you know how to pick them. <laughs> Our next recipient, native New Yorker Clayton Stevenson, began studying piano at the age of seven in what he describes as a Chinatown piano school in a basement somewhere. <laughs> but from those beginnings, his musical education blossomed through New York City's community music programs like the Third Street Music School and the Young People's Choir, which led to his acceptance into Juilliard's pre-college at the age of 10. Since then, Clayton has made his mark on the musical world as the first black finalist at the Van Cliburn International Piano Competition and the inaugural winner of the Nina Simone Piano Competition. He's been hailed by gramophone as not just a remarkable virtuoso, but a poet, a dramatist, and a master storyteller. Please welcome our next 2024 Avery Fisher Career Grant recipient, pianist Clayton Stevenson.
Congratulations. Uh, in addition to your concert schedule, you are at Harvard and the New England Conservatory at the same time. How's that all working out? Um, you know, you have to segment yourself, I think. Um, right now, I'm in my piano mode, and then when I go into my economics, I'm in economics mode. And <laughs> I think that's, that's the way I segment my life right now. And tell us about the Van Cliburn competition. How was that for you? It was quite an experience for me because that was the first really big competition that I've ever done. And I knew I wasn't prepared. Um, and because I was at Harvard at the time, you know, my beloved teacher, she was saying, you know, you're not ready. You know, you don't even have half of the pieces learned. And I said, you know, I don't care. I want to do it because, you know, I did the Junior Van Cliburn competition as a kid. And it was always an inspirational thing for me to do. And I went into it with about half a year's worth of, of time to prepare. And, you know, my teacher said this very funny thing. She said, you know, you have a higher chance of winning the lottery than getting into the... <laughs> <laughs> than getting into the finals of the Van Cliburn competition. And so I said, okay, <laughs> I'm not going to practice the final round because I'm not going to get there anyway, right? We're just doing a good showing, getting out in the semis. And so as I progress, I'm getting more and more nervous and I'm saying, oh no, what am I going to do if I get into the finals? And finals comes around, they announce them, and lo and behold, I'm one of the six. And if you see the pictures, all the rest of the five are so happy, and I'm there just in despair because I know that I'm about to... <laughs> and at that time, one of the concertos I wrote down for the finals was Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto, which, as people know, is the hardest piano concerto ever written, and it's not a good piece to do unprepared. And so my teacher called, and she said, you know, see, you're in trouble now. What are you going to do? <laughs> and um, I really wanted to play the other concerto I was doing, Gershwin's Concerto in F, because I love both jazz and classical and, and almost every genre out there. And so I was determined to do it, and luckily I had four days to prepare. And so in four days, I somehow, with my teacher, you know, Zoom calling me every morning, you know, just teaching me, singing for me, um, it was somehow I was able to memorize it and, and made it through. And so Maestro Alsop, she was very nice to me. And at the end, when I finished, she said, you know, how did you do? Uh, how did you feel? And I said, I made it through. And she said, yes, you did. And so. <laughs> <laughs> can the two of us play the lottery after the show today? We can try. <laughs> uh, you're going to play a piece by Leopold Godofsky. What are we going to hear? Uh, it's his symphonic metamorphosis on one of Strauss's famous comedic operas, The Fluttermouse, which is the revenge of the bat. <laughs> All right, if you want to go ahead and get ready, I'll uh, introduce it a little more formally. This is the symphonic metamorphosis on themes from Johann Strauss's The Fluttermouse. Once again, please hear it. Let's hear it for Clayton Stevenson.
pianist Clayton Stevenson. Music of Leopold Gadovsky, his symphonic metamorphosis on themes of Johann Strauss's Deflator Mouse. Performed by the 2024 Avery Fisher Career Grant recipient. Clayton, congratulations. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs> Our next recipient, violinist Julian Ree, made his debut at the age of eight with the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra. That was just the beginning of his career as a soloist and chamber musician performing with symphony symphonies across the country and venues around the world. Julian was praised by the magazine The Strad for the kind of poise and showmanship that thrills audiences. And in 2022, he, he was announced as the newest player of the 1699 Lady Tenant Stradivarius through a loan by Mary B. Galvin Foundation. And starting this year, Julian will be joining the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center's Bowers program as part of a three-year residency. Please welcome our next Avery Fisher Career Grant recipient, violinist Julian Ree. So, uh, Lady Tenant, Str what's the deal with the female violin here? <laughs> I promise I didn't assign it. That wasn't me. Um, but this is through the incredible generosity as well as the bow I've been working with. The, is by made by Jean-Marie Persois um, through the generosity of the Stradivari Society, the Mary B. Galvin Foundation. And um, I've been so lucky that I have people from here, um, from Bind and Fushi, and from my entire team here to support me as well. So, thank you. Um, you've won a lot of competitions, uh, including the Almar Oliveira International, but you received a Community Engagement Award. What was that about? Oh boy, um, that was one of the more daunting experiences of my life. Um, thank you for letting me hash it out again in front of everybody. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, well, so... That's what I'm here for. <laughs> yeah. And so the, the way it, it was was that the night before we were informed that we were going to play or present in front of 100 middle schoolers for about 45 minutes. So Tough audience, right? I know, I know. So I think everybody knows that's a very tall order. And so I think the main thing was it just taught me how to think of my feet and to be able to react to obviously an audience that's very atypical to a concert. Um, and I think it's the same with being on stage in this moment as well, either with a collaborator or engaging with an audience that's incredibly alive. And so it was that same kind of feeling, I think, having that kind of preparation to work in front of younger students who are incredibly engaging, but that interaction has certainly served me well to, in every interaction. And in the future for you, what are, what's next? Well, I'll graduate in May from New England Conservatory, go NEC. Um, <laughs> the president's here too, so <laughs> brownie points. Is, is he gonna graduate? <laughs> Just checking. My theory teacher should be listening. I'm gonna pass, I promise. Um, so I'll graduate in May and I'll officially transition out of being a full-time student, which, which I've been the last six years. And starting in September, I'll be in that kind of, you know, see what happens freelance life. Um, so as you mentioned, I'll be starting with the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center. And so among other things, I think having the support of the Avery Fisher family and being a part of this is that kind of safety net that gives you that security to go out, forge out into the world and kind of see what it has to offer for you. So that's, that's kind of been my mindset for the last, last few months. What are we gonna hear? Alrighty, so my amazing friend and wonderful pianist Chelsea Wong and I will be playing the final movement from Saint-Saëns' first violin piano sonata in D minor. And this final movement is broken up into two parts. The first being a very kind of fleeting scherzando. It's full of mysticism. It's got these kind of colorful images as they, as they pass by, but it's all a bit veiled. And then the final part is just, it's a full-on riot. It's, it's exuberance, it's joy, and a big part of the reason I wanted to perform this particular work was not only to showcase the full range of the violin and the piano, but really, in essence, this piece, I feel like, captures the full mood of today's event, which is joy, it's coming together, it's really letting loose kind of a lot of work that's been that's gone into putting me in this position by people, my family, it's really an entire village that's put me here. So uh, I think this piece is just an opportunity to let loose in the end. All righty, great. Well, let's hear it. 
This is uh, Julian Ree, violinist, Chelsea Wong, the Camille Sesson Sonata Number no. 1 in D minor. Enjoy.
You called it a riot, right? A riot indeed. Two movements from the Camille Sasson, Sonata Number no. 1 in D minor. Chelsea Wong, the pianist, and Julian Ree, violinist. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Wow. All right, finally, Grammy nominated sandbox percussion was brought together by the joy of performing music together. Champions for New Repertoire, they've collaborated with composers like John Luther Adams and Andy Akiho. Sandbox is known for incorporating visuals with their works. In fact, their 2021 album, Seven Pillars, featured an evening-length work by Andy Akiho with stage direction and lighting design and films accompanying each movement of the work. Founders of the New School Sandbox Percussion Seminar, every year they introduce percussion students to the repertoire that they love. They are currently in residence at the University of Missouri in Kansas City and the New Schools College of Performing Arts. Please welcome our next and final 2024 Avery Fisher Career Grant recipients, Johnny Allen, Victor Cachese, Ian Rosenbaum, and Terry Sweeney, Sandbox Percussion.
So we're going to park ourselves over here for a minute because uh, you've got a lot, little bit of a setup over there. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, pay no attention to the man over there. Tell us how you came together. Yeah, so Sandbox was formed in 2011, uh, and it came about just through a natural love of playing percussion chamber music together. We all went to the Yale School of Music. Uh, chamber music was a big part of the curriculum when we were there, and it was kind of the thing we loved to do the most. I remember we had this burning desire to start a percussion quartet, and we were all in slightly different places in our kind of school career at that time, so when we got together we rehearsed usually like once a month on weekends, and we were playing this music that we really loved. Some pieces that we had the privilege to play when we were in school and some others that we didn't, um, and just sort of started to build a repertoire, and then that transitioned into working with more living composers, commissioning work, and that's a big part of what Sandbox does. But the original impetus was, was very much just a, a love for playing chamber music together. And, and the commissioning, was it out of uh, both a love for new music, I guess, and also maybe a lack of repertoire for the kind of uh, toys you have on the stage? Yeah, I mean, we, um, we, we don't have nearly as much repertoire as a string quartet, and so a lot of what we have to do is convince composers to write new things for us to play. And uh, talk to us about uh, the seminar that, you, that we talked about at the, uh, the new school. Yeah, so the, the seminar is something that's been going on uh, for a number of years now. For a week uh, at the new school, we invite students from really all over the world to join us and rehearse, learn, and perform chamber music, percussion chamber music. Um, we actually we create these groups with the students, so one member of Sandbox will actually perform with all of the students. Uh, and it's a really fun week. We play music all day long for an entire week, and it sort of um, leads to a concert at the end of the week. It's sort of one of the highlights of our year. And I mentioned the visuals that you do. We were chatting earlier. We bonded on the fact of adding visuals to classical music. Why did you guys think that that was important for your work? This particular piece, Seven Pillars, the, the composer loved this idea. When he was writing the piece, he had some sort of visual uh, in his mind. And so even in the composition process, we started to think about something that we could add to our performance to enhance what we were doing on stage. And so in this case, what you're going to see is a little bit of a lighting design uh, that we are controlling from the stage. So as things are happening in our performance, uh, we are mimicking them with the uh, lights. And um, I, I, I see some unusual things on the stage. I see, is that a, a pitcher of, of water somewhere? There is a pitcher up there on stage. No water in it, but yeah, that thing right there is a pitcher from a hotel. Uh, we have... Um, Does the hotel know about that? They do. Yes, we a or the composer asked very nicely if he could have four of them, so yeah. It just had the right sound, right? <laughs> exactly. It has a good sound. You'll see. Um, and there's some also th some fun instruments here. We have right here some tuned metal pipes. So you literally go to Home Depot and you buy a long pipe, and if you cut it to different lengths, they give you different pitches. I can just see that in the aisle of Home Depot, <laughs> what that sounds, people are, what are you doing? But you got to test it, right? Exactly, yeah, and it, it sounds really nice, yeah. What else? What else are we looking at? Well, we have like a, a mix of these uh, homemade instruments like Victor's talking about, but then some more traditional instruments, the vibraphone, we have a kick drum in the back there. That's a concert bass drum that you would normally see in an orchestra, but it's kind of set up like a super kick drum, so you'll see them playing it with a, with a foot pedal. So it's a mix of traditional instruments and homemade instruments. And um, I mean, when people often think of percussion, they think more rhythm than notes, but clearly there's, there's a lot of capability of that for both up here, right? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Certainly you're about to hear a lot of rhythm, um, but we also play on obviously all these pitched instruments as well, and there's lots of really beautiful, interesting melodies and harmonies that get passed around in this piece on all of the pitched percussion instruments. And uh, how do you get this on an airplane? <laughs> so this piece, Seven Pillars, it's like a, it's a logistical feat to get it on tour, which we do a lot of. There's like a spreadsheet of exactly what you have to put in seven suitcases. We were really psyched that seven pillars fits in seven suitcases. <laughs> uh, but there's like this whole spreadsheet of every piece of equipment you have to put in so it stays under 50 pounds so that we can fly. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a thing, but we... God forbid you that. should have to pay for the extra baggage. Right? It's enough to bring all the suitcases on the plane. We don't want to pay for the overweight. Yeah. All right, are we close? Should I let you guys get in position? Are we, are we getting there? All right, go ahead. Uh, and uh, so we're going to hear pillar number five from Andy Akio's Seven Pillars. This is commissioned and performed by Sandbox Percussion.
Johnny Allen, Victor Cachese, Ian Rosenbaum, and Terry Sweeney performing Andy Akio's Pillar Number Five from his Seven Pillars. Let's bring out all of the recipients of the Avery Fisher Career Dance. Just everyone, be careful when you come out of the lights. The Ballard Day Quartet. <laughs> Violinist NGO McGrevious. Violinist Julian Ree. Pianist Clayton Stevenson. And of course, the Sandbach Percussion. Congratulations to all of you. Thanks so much to the staff of the Green Space, everyone at WQXR. Thanks to our friends at Steinway for the stereo piano. Big thanks to Veronique Fakushni for everything that you do. I'm Elliot Forrest. Thank you for joining us for tonight, and thank you for coming. <laughs>